clean, modern styling. No knobs or gadgets in sight. Superb cabinetry, master crafted of the finest woods. In 1958, preeminent American broadcaster Edward Murrow said of television, it can teach, it can illuminate, and it can even inspire. But it can only do so to the extent that humans are determined to use it to those ends. Otherwise, it is nothing but wires and lights in a box. 200 years on and, for better or worse, television is now the cornerstone of Western culture. There's barely a household in Australia without a 600-inch plasma, not only because it presents as an understated affluence for the outer suburban working class, but also because Two and a Half Men is that much funnier when you can watch a life-size Charlie Sheen mumble something misogynistic. I don't see any laundry. Australian television is nothing if not a fertile breeding ground for high art. Free-to-air television consists of five major networks. The seven networks' artistic merit lies in its relentless cross-promoting. This is great tennis. Almost as great as packed to the rafters. Not to mention the vicarious excursions into high society, notably the ever-so-classy Dancing with the Stars. The Nine Network, once a bastion of investigative journalism and locally produced variety programming, now prioritises game-changing sitcoms like the cliché-avoiding Big Bang Theory. <laughs> Those nerds are real characters, aren't they? The Ten Network meets its cop jargon quota with Law and Order, followed by a new randomly generated acronym every episode, with the rest of the schedule dominated by revealing reality programming, like MasterChef and The Biggest Loser which challenge viewers by illuminating, in great detail, the visually stimulating, extraordinary activities of cooking and exercising respectively. The government-funded ABC engages the ethnically rich think tank that is Australian popular culture by commissioning Chris Lilly to paint his face black and cuss incessantly, operating under the mantra that tackling taboos by merely playing them is hilarious. And finally, the Special Broadcasting Service, which features the broadest range of content from all corners of the globe, and also features the broadest range of breasts and unkempt vaginas, salacious softcore pornography masquerading as edgy foreign language films. The Shin, a vehicle whistle. But indulge me for a minute, if you will, as we stroll together down memory lane, back to where it all began, the beginning of time in 1929. Australian TV began experimentally in 1929, right here in Old Melbourne town. But it would take until well after the Second World War for Australian TV to commence regular transmission, just in time for the 1956 Melbourne Olympic Games. Finally, there's something on the box. Robert Menzies' government stipulated that the first tier of television be government-funded, the ABC, and the second tier be privately owned commercial stations that would draw their income from advertising revenue. In the late 50s and early 60s, personalities like Graham Kennedy and Bob Dyer became our first real superstars of the small screen by the medium of the variety show, where guests would chat with polished, charismatic hosts. I've got the absolute pleasure today of being joined by a young Australian band, uh, Fast Dinosaurs. Hello, gentlemen, how are you? Hello. Wonderful. Uh, and you're just about to release your new long player here, uh, which I have had listened to, some fantastic pop tunes, and it's going to go right to the, po uh, the, the top of the charts. I'm sure you'll agree. Most of the album was written in the six months before we recorded, and we recorded back in July of last year. And uh, a lot of people are comparing your, your current sound to, to a band that is uh, yet to release anything, in, in fact, uh, called, called The Strokes. We're proud of that like, influence, because like, they, they brought us up, basically from like kids to wanting to play music. So um, yeah, I'm pretty proud of the fact that they are an influence because they are a really cool influence to have. Now go out on the road and, and play these albums. I gather you're touring around the country uh, during, during April. It's a good opportunity to play to a crowd that might actually know some of the songs because mm. whenever we play the singles, we get a great reaction. So 
hopefully all of the songs from the new album will have, have that same reaction. Absolutely. Well, uh, Last Dinosaur is a wonderful young band from uh, Australia and very articulate, lovely young men too. Go and buy their new long player in a million years from your local record store. Good night. The Logies, named after TV pioneer John Logie Baird, was established to recognise the outstanding achievements of Aussies in the industry, like international megastar John Wood. In 1965, what we now know as Channel 10 was launched, and the network quickly set out to engage teenage viewers and was a preeminent network in pop music programming. Ultimately, it was proven that young people are in fact engaged by programs that are a hybrid of pious Generation Y preaching and predictable topical humour. And so the project was born. Indeed, viewers' only indication of whether a topic is serious or silly is by way of Charlie Pickering's smug facial expressions. In June 1967, Australia participated in the historic Our World broadcast, the first live global satellite television hookup involving 14 countries. The UK's contribution saw the Beatles performing their new hit All You Need Is Love live from Abbey Road in London, while Australia's contribution showed a Melbourne tram leaving the depot. This watershed moment in Australian entertainment would set an insurmountably high watermark for our contribution to the Western world. In the early days, most households didn't even have TVs. Amazing to think now, isn't it? Just try and imagine a world without television. How did you go? Other notable highlights in the 60s included Play School, Four Corners, the stalwart of television journalism, Melbourne produced police drama Homicide, the lovable Here's Humphrey, and perhaps most significantly of all, Skippy the Bush Kangaroo. Skip. Where are you? Skip. 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 The 70s saw the VFL being aired live to Victorians for the first time ever, and also the advent of government subsidies for the production of local series, leading to a boom in Australian content. Countdown with Molly, Hey Hey It's Saturday with Daryl, Young Talent Time, The Young Doctors, and by 1975, everyone could see them in colour too. The 70s also marked the emergence of Bert Newton and Denise Drysdale, the former being renowned for his voluptuous face, and the latter recognised for her moon boobs. I remember when I was 10 years old and thought she was smoking hot. Now, well, I'd still be interested to see her with her top off. The 80s kicked off with the launch of SBS, and in 86, Neighbours commenced, initially on the Seven Network, and has since become the longest-running series in Australian television history, achieving great success in the motherland, and launching the careers of international stars like Guy Pearce and Al Kylie. Home and Away would start soon after, and would launch the careers of stars like Heath Ledger, Naomi Watts and Samuel L. Jackson. The 90s was the renaissance of gritty Aussie dramas with lots of swearing, corrupt cops and pregnant teen mums. The leader of the pack was Blue Healers, which combined weekly homicides in a town with a population of 12 and sexual tension between Lisa McCune and the other guy, as well as sporadic choreographed dance routines from international megastar John Wood. Oh, fair go, PJ. You want to mount Thomas Finest, but you're not going to have that case wrapped up before the end of the day. You're dreaming, mate. <laughs> you want to get your hand off a doll? Have it wrapped up in a jiffy, mate. What are you up to tonight? Oh, not heads. Might just pop down to the deli for a Powerade or something like that. Oh, yeah. To be totally frank with you, I've got no idea where I am right now. Australian TV was at an all-time high. Good Newsweek was cool. Johnson and Friends was cooler. And sports people's responses had yet to become cliches because they had yet to infiltrate every program on every network. It looked, for a moment, as if Australia could really take it to the big boys in the television entertainment world. Then, inevitably, two new leagues of competition emerged, casting long, menacing shadows over the television landscape. 1994 saw community programming licences being handed out. And while the powers at be miscalculated that pointing cameras at tanks full of fish would see them tear the entertainment world apart, pay TV like Foxtel, Optus and Galaxy offered something that free-to-air could not. Old episodes of Everybody Loves Raymond, 24-hour Everybody no, no, Loves Raymond marathons no, and behind-the-scenes specials of Everybody Loves Raymond. 
What? No. Uh, uh, yeah, but I don't need a hat. Okay, please let me. Oh. Free to air networks responded in kind by launching a reality television focused assault on all fronts. With Big Brother and Australian Idol leading the charge, proving that sometimes real people can make for really interesting viewing. Touchdown, free to air! In 2007, the introduction of new HD and SD channels blurred the lines between pay and free-to-air television, facilitating the emergence of brand new underground comedies like Cheers, Seinfeld and Frasier. The proliferation of these imported programs is simple evidence that buying is cheaper than making. While it costs roughly $800,000 to produce one hour of underbelly or pack to the rafters, it costs the Nine Network only $100,000 to purchase an hour of two and a half men. This cost disparity has led many to question the viability of commercial networks in facilitating locally produced content. What content we do make has to be made cheaply. In terms of music, comedy and variety entertainment, cheap is shorthand for recycling the same cohort of tired, middle-of-the-road, foul-mouthed bogan entertainers. As it stands, these comedians, FM hosts and bit part B-graders illustrate that the very best talent in our country isn't actually very good at all. This understanding of mediocrity as excellence is reflected in mainstream Australian culture. Oh, hey, that Mick Malloy comes a fucking piss, all right? <laughs> yeah, no, you're all right. So, what's the alternative? Webisodes and independent new media like Poncho are now gaining fans from all over the world as culturally interested young people actively satisfy their own tastes without ever indulging the litany of imbeciles on television. As the balance of power shifts to our generation, we will soon have the ability to put these mediocre idiots out of work. And not with a view to making television irrelevant, but to making feeble television irrelevant. If you are in it for the fame, and you don't stand for anything, and you have no talent, we will expose you and punch your new nose down your throat. If you're an entertainer, and you're safe, you're passe, you will not survive. You should be mowing lawns or shining shoes, Get off my television. We will come at you hard. Interviewers asking pop stars how they're finding Australia. We will light you on fire. Banality is not acceptable. Grant Denyer, Kerry Ann, Koshy, Sonia Kruger. We will take you out to sea, pin cheese on your privates and feed you to the piranhas. Yes, the poncho camera work is shaky and our graphics look like they've been drawn with the non-preferred hand of a person with no hands and the host may be a verbose sociopath but soon everyone will have blonde tips and a majestic deep voice because we will not relent we will slash your tires we will kick and scream and we will crush the idiots <laughs> <laughs>